Adventure. Now I'm Pudman on W4CY Radio. Wake up, America! It's time for the Adventures of Hype Man on W4CY.com, West Palm Beach's number one internet radio station. Here's your host, the Pipe Man. This is Pipe Man here on the Adventures of Pipe Man, W4CY Radio, and I'm here with... Bill Saxton. Nice. And tell us why you're here at Bloodstock. I'm here to tell you, well, I'm here at the minute, I'm filming some of the History of Roadrunner Records documentary series. Uh, through interviews with various artists, a lot of B-roll, a lot of pit footage, uh, and generally having a good time. Nice. So, did you come up with the idea of the documentary? Yeah, I can get... Do you want, do you want the full story? It's quite... Yes. A, yeah, all right. Okay, you, you're at risk of being bored to tears, so stop me when it gets boring. So, in the <laughs> pandemic, um, I, I, was going, I was going a little bit stir-crazy, as many of us were. Uh, and I was playing a little too much video games, a bit too much Stardew Valley, a bit too much Counter-Strike. And I sort of figured, ah, I need to generate some sort of, I need to use this energy in a different way. And it, it actually occurred to me that no one had come out with a book about Roadrunner Records. No one had done a documentary series. No one had really talked about it outside of liner notes. That's wild. It's mental, isn't it? It's absolutely mental. What the so, fuck? Such a legacy. So I just thought, ah, fuck it, I'll just do it myself. So I started writing up the, what I understood the history to be. Maybe the idea was maybe a book or something like that. And I put it up in a few blog posts. Um, on my website and um, by chance I was watching a stream with another um, UT, uh, UK journalist and I started talking about this thing that I'm doing this history of road and records blog series and Michelle Kerr who's here today from Cosa Nostra PR she DM'd me and said okay so when this is finished let me know because I worked there for 17 years and I was like oh shit it's got to be good now yeah, and everybody that was anybody worked at Roadrunner. Exactly, man. Is and, and the, the whole end of the story is, if you used to work at Roadrunner, you now work in some sort of very successful independent outfit, whether it's PR, a and you know, anything like that. It's, it's fascinating. So since then, since Michelle gave me that sort of remit of, you know, I'm, I'm going to see this once it's done, I was like, oh, shit. So then I started escalating a little bit, and I started inviting all the old artists to Zoom interviews, and start a podcast series called The Temple of Blair off the back of that. And so once I got through about 30 interviews, I, I turned that into a, a documentary, which was History of Roadrunner Records, 80 to 86. Um, and that was pretty well received. I mean, it's a small fry, it's YouTube's tiny channel and things like that. But we went down into the, the granular detail of people who worked in the office in the 80s, uh, all about Case Vessels, the, uh, the founder of the label. Uh, and all these old bands that even the ones that small bands that not a lot of people have heard of were all in this little mini documentary that I created. Um, and I put that up. And then a, a, uh, an orthodontist, would you believe, got in touch and said, right, stop what you're doing. Stop fucking around. I'm going to fund a production company. Just do this properly. And that's where we are today. So now I'm here with cameras, product, broadcast quality cameras, um, speaking to the great and the good about this wonderful... Uh, corporate outfit which didn't have that such an impact on metal yeah and you know so yeah it's like anybody knows everybody i i used to deal with people in the states and all the publicists i know in the states almost all of them worked at roadrunner records it's like yeah if you're in this industry you worked at roadrunner records yeah yeah <laughs> it's, it's the great i mean it's the i've heard this term before and people can compete me on it but it's the last great independent label is yeah. what i heard of what is it's kind of like the, the moniker they kind of go by you know and it's it's the impact it's had on the metal scene is just and the hard rock scene for that matter is without question gigantic and how did you find that people feel about it being no longer about it being no longer well, it's it's still there. It's still there, but it's obviously a subsidiary of Warner, Electra, right. and things like but that. But as it was, yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of reverence for that 1980 to 2012 period. So you're referring to 2012 when Warner bought out the rest of the label, and a lot of people got fired. And now it's sort of since then it's gone on in a um, still a strong label, but not many people work there. It's got a different kind of feel to it. Um, you know, it's. The thing we got to understand is from 80 to 2012, that was like a family of people. Right. It was a house full of nut jobs that made it work. And when that house stopped, ceased to be, 
something something was missing. I mean, yeah. they're still doing great stuff. I mean, Slipknot and Trivium are still banging out great albums. Gojira is still banging out great albums. They've still got a strong roster, Motionless in White, Creeper, things like that. But there's a, there's a ragtag element to that previous era, which is the one we're all familiar with, you know? That's what this documentary is focusing on. You know, what I've noticed as a press person is that, yes, for the Slipknot to the world, it's still great. But what made it great was the smaller bands that be, even a Slipknot that became Slipknot, you know, yeah. like the type of thing that, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't seem like that exists anymore. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to get a Sepultura story right. anymore. You know, it, and that's partly down to the culture which Roadrunner exists in now. I mean, back then it was literally ta 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 demo, 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 demo. It was all word of mouth. It was all tape trading. It was a different, to get a band from their mum's garage up onto a stage on, like in a different country, it took the legwork of a lot of people and it took a lot of inspirational moments of people going, I can see where this band is going to go. I can see what's going to happen here. We need to elevate this and we need to fund it. And that's what Roadrunner was great at. And that's, nice. the, that's the bit that's um, kind of been lost, you know. But that's, just, again, an industry thing rather than a Roadrunner thing. What, what's the, in interviewing these artists, what's, what have you found or feelings of the artists about how it's changed or, you know, what it is today from their perspective? Hmm. From their perspective, it's very much the lacks of family value these days. There's less of a family value. And it's, you say that in the staff as well. Like a lot of the, one of the most common things I hear about are the Christmas parties. The road runner Christmas parties were the ones to be at. Like in, in terms of all the industry events, the road runner Christmas party in New York was the one that had to happen. Or you had to attend. And there's so many stories to fall off the back of that. Like stuff that happened on so-and-so's desk. So-and-so's car got the tires like that. All these things. And it's those kind of moments which we don't really have anymore. You know? Yeah, totally. Do you think not having an independent label being an independent label anymore mm. has changed the industry drastically? I think it has in a, in a number of ways. I think it's really hard to quantify the success, right? I mean, I was speaking to Gatecreeper yesterday. Gatecreeper, in terms of their monthly listeners on Spotify, it hasn't, they haven't risen dramatically in the last few years, but their profile is huge. They're a big band. They're a big metal band. So it's really hard to sort of say what's successful or not, right? Yeah. That's a massive factor, I think. I mean, back in the day, it was just, okay, sales, first week sales, that was, and the Nielsen numbers, that was the thing. Now it's, people think it's streams, it's really the merge numbers, it's really the ticket numbers and the attendance. It's hard to really drill down, at least from my yeah. perspective anyway. In doing this, you've interviewed artists, you've interviewed publicists probably, people that work there. All the business, yeah. Have you interviewed listeners that weren't working there or an artist? That's why I'm here. So once I'm done here, I'm going to have a beer. I'm going to take the gimbal out into the field of Bloodstock. And I'm going to find people with the typo negative t-shirts, uh, with the Wednesday 13 murder doll slipknot stuff, and say, what's your experience with this? Oh, dude, there was a guy in the shuttle bus that took me, brought me down here and said, I've got a slipknot story. I had to pick Slipknot up for Download Festival, and they were all on mass. They were very polite young men. And then when I got them later, they had the masks on it. It was, fuck this, fuck that. And I told them, no swearing in my bus. And they were very apologetic, very kind young men. It's stuff like nice. that. You know, because that's, that's how we learn about the impact of this of, of all the artists on that label, right? I love hearing that. Uh, I, and I found the difference from a press perspective. Like, I used to interview all the Roadrunner bands, and it would be like I would email and immediately get something set up. And now you're kind of lost in the corporate environment corporate environment is the is the most common term used for late 2000s into the 2010s yeah yeah exactly yeah. but again it's not necessarily indicative of roadrunner alone it's a wider industry thing especially it feels like in a way like on the spectrum of labels massive majors tiny indies the middle has kind of been erased in a weird way yeah yeah you know yeah. what i mean so it's either you're gonna get the laptop labels and the ones that are slightly bigger and then we just go jump straight up to you're not going to be able to speak to anyone because it gets lost in the void and the corporate void you know you know what's interesting about that it's exactly how the world is like yeah. i don't know about here but in my country there is no middle anymore it's either here or there yeah. meaning high or low and there's no middle anymore yeah yeah so it's, it's sign of the times it's a sign of the times and again it's just shocking that 
with regards to Roadrunner, which is, I think it's unquestionably like the biggest one of that ilk, but no one's recorded it. No one's recorded the, the history of it. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I really don't know. I can't. That's a, that's a question that I cannot answer about Roadrunner Records. Why no one bothered to do this? And just to be clear as well, I'm a nobody. I am a nobody. I'm not a filmmaker. I was forced into filmmaking because no one else was going to do it. I'm right. doing this. I mean, you can see the stuff I've had to lug all the way from the car park to make this work. It's, it's, it's just, it's weird. There should be someone out there. This is Banger TV's territory, right? This is the sort that they should have been on their roster, in my opinion. It would have been perfect for them. But, have you talked to Thunderflix, who is here too, about getting your documentary on there? Oh my word, Samwell from Thunderflix. Like we spoke first, like must be months ago. Now he came on the podcast as Thunderflix was launching. He was one of the first ones to say it's got a home here, and I said, "Yes, it does." Nice. Yes, so when it does come out, which it will, it'll just take a few years, you know. I love it. What do you think is the best thing you found out from doing all this, and the worst thing you found out? Oh, okay, so. There's so, there's so many. There's so many, man. Okay, so the best thing I found out was... So, as a, as a function, Roadrunner was largely a distribution fun, uh, a distribution and licensing uh, function for Europe. Right. So, like, there was a connection with Music for Nations, Megaforce. So, you might have a Metallica CD that has Roadrunner on it if it's in Europe. And that function never stopped. So, out there, somewhere in the Netherlands... There's a Sinead O'Connor CD with the Roadrunner logo on it. Wow. Because they all constantly kept this like licensing operation going. It's what kept the lights on in a big way. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. But in terms of the worst, the worst, the worst, the worst. I'm trying to pick my brain on finding something that's not litigious. <laughs> not too damaging to anyone's brand. Yeah, right. No, there was a lot of stories where Roadrunner might pull the tour support from someone while they're on the road. There's one that's recorded when the Life of Agony were on the road. And the tour support got pulled. So they ended up bunking with the typo negative guys. Wow. You know, it's, there's things like that. And again, it's just the business. But um, yeah, Roadrunner's got, it's, it's, it's history is a lot of highs and a lot of lows. How many people have you talked to that want to see an independent label at their level come back into the into the realm just like we were talking about there's no middle how many people have said we want this back every single one why because it's, it's tangible it's vivid there's usually the footfall is such that everything that's every function that a label can um, can perform at its best is when it's done among friends and when it's done when you get that network of people it can't expand past a certain amount and it can't be too small and it can't function so that little middle ground is the sweet spot. And that's what everyone wants these days. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to elevate the artists and also try and inform the consumer like what can individuals do to try and push the, push the fringes of the genre and elevate it and make sure that everyone's getting their fair due. And I think it's really, that's, that's the end point, trying to find that middle ground and push people towards it. Do you think between everybody you talk to, doing this documentary that somebody will come out of the woodwork and do something about that and create another middle. The best thing I can do, the best thing I can do is inform. I guess that's the agenda, right? We all want to elevate the artist. We all want to empower the outlier genres and create something commercially viable. Who better to ask than Roadrunner? But that's, that's the agenda. It's just trying to explain that in an academic manner. How did Roadrunner do this? And hopefully off the back of that, someone will come out and go, oh, it's just a matter of like building a house, inhabiting it with nut jobs like Roadrunner was, and then pushing the art that way and pushing the products and recruiting the bands and pushing them, you know, pushing them in a localized sort of manner that's sustainable and that can be, everyone gets their fair due, everyone can get their fair pay. You know, I think, I think hopefully the documentary will inform, advise, and encourage that kind of activity. So... Of all the people you've uh, talked to, all the information you've gathered, from your perspective, how would you compare the Roadrunner of then to, besides the licensing in Europe, yeah, yeah, yeah. to a Megaforce or a Metal Blade? How would I compare it? It's a tough question because the ins and outs of it are, are, are kind of interesting. So Roadrunner, I, I call their earlier days, especially if we're talking Metal Blade and Megaforce back in like the 80s, Roadrunner, I call it low and wide, right? 
lots of bands, not a lot of massive investment. So it's like, you know, with like a few thousand dollars to get your first album out or something like that. Megaforce was the other way around. It was like very few signings per year, but there was a lot of push behind it. And then Metal Blade was sort of somewhere in between. And Metal Blade's a different beast because it was very much like a, it was a fan's label for fans in a weird way. Roadrunner was founded by a 40-year-old opera fan. So, and a Dutch guy at that. So it, it was a lot more, and a music industry veteran at that. So we, they came in, not knowing about metal, but knowing about the business and knowing what was working. So it's, wow. it's really difficult. It's, you know, actually, it's easy to compare on those terms. You know what I mean? And Johnny Z himself for Megaforce, he came from like a mineral trading business. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, it's still a business guy at heart, but what? also a music guy. You want to hear a Metal Blade story? Go for it. Back in the 80s. The reason I'm here today is because of Metal Blade. Reason being is me and my friends used to go to this record store in the Valley mm. called Oz Records. Right. There was a store clerk there. Mm. And you probably know part of this by the way I see you smiling. And he used to, or you heard me say it over the weekend. No, 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 no. Um, and he used to hand us albums when we walked in. Listen to this. Listen to this. And we went to all our gigs and bought all our albums based on Brian's recommendation. Yeah. And I saw him a few years back and I'm like, you know, what you did back then was the most genius marketing plan ever. And he's like, I was just a record store clerk. Yeah. But that's the point. You weren't just a record store clerk. You were, but then you could find your audience. Yeah. And you could promote your label to that audience and put all t all the pieces of the puzzle together, mm. and because and that's why because of Metal Blade is why I became such a metalhead and why I'm here sitting with you today. This, I had a conversation with Eric German. He's like a um, he's like an entertainment lawyer. Works with like Asking Alexandria, uh, Bad Wolves, a few things like that. And he was telling me that. One thing that seemed to work in the 80s and well, in the, the glory years of the record industry and doesn't quite fit today is there's not as much law, L-O-R-E, in artists these days. Whereas back in the day, all things stemmed from Brian Slagle, all things stemmed from Monty Connor. There was like a genealogy you could track. And because you could track it and there was like a family tree aesthetic to it, you can kind of, it felt more special. Like if I said, if... In 1990, if someone said, oh, we're a Bay Area thrash band, you sort of go, aha, I know there's like a, there's like a lineage here. There's the big four, but there's yeah. also like Defiance, After Effect. There's all these other bands that are there, and that makes it feel more special, and that's what engages people more. You know what I mean? And that's I think that's another difference between those days and these days, and Brian's a big part of that, right? And, and to your point, the Metal Massacre albums. Exactly. Yeah. First time I ever heard Metallica, mm. besides going to their show, but I mean, listen to their, like I heard them before that, by going to a show, mm. but was Metal Massacre. And it was like, all those bands on the Metal Massacre albums were like, that's how I would find out about the bands. Yeah. You know, or I remember very specifically one day walking in and, you know, uh, Oz Records, Brian would get in all these import albums. Mm. He handed me this album by this band that was from over here. Mm. So it was an import album. And was considered, and probably wouldn't be considered today, the first black metal band. Right. And that album, like, changed my life. At first, it scared me to death, because there was nothing like that before, and that was Welcome to Hell by Venom. Right. And I remember bringing it home, because back then, it wasn't like now, where you can listen to a track, you had to buy the album. Mm hmm and then you listen to it, whether you liked it or not, because you just spent money on it yep. that you didn't have. Mm. And I remember listening to album, and like back then, you listen to albums, and you went through the whole experience of looking at all the artwork, reading the lyrics. Mm. I can remember so visually in my head, like literally getting scared reading the lyrics. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> I can't be listening to shit. But I couldn't stop listening to it either. Yeah, yeah. And then it was like, it was all over after that. There's something about that whole spending your money on a record. The thing that we're like today is the scarcity. The scarcity yeah. is what also drives that engagement and drives that law. You know what I mean? When you go to the when you go to a gig to a band that you don't know if anyone likes this band or not, and you find it's a packed room, then that's an energy. There's a real kind of electricity to that sort of moment. And I think that's what 
that's the mission, right? That's the mission. We've got to create the scarcity and make sure that all the great bands aren't slipping through the net, right? And it takes people with experience and takes people with know-how of how to administrate that metal and how to administrate those genres and those acts and things like that and push it to where it needs to go. And I think the net analogy is the right one. Don't let anything slip through the net. Get, let the good ones be you know, promoted and pushed. So do you think a metal blade record who st- who records who's still around mm. would be able to fill that gap to bring that middle back again? There's no reason why not. There's absolutely zero reason why not. I think to facilitate that, we need to create some sort of environment where we know we're not going to miss anything. And in theory, we're there with Spotify. In theory, we're there with Apple Music. And in theory, we're there. But there is an oversaturation, and there's a lot of guff in the current market that's not, you know, there's, there's not going to deliver what Metal Blade or Roadrunner could do. So there's just no reason why not. Maybe, maybe we just need like an army of A&R guys to go through everything and yeah. just go, shit, 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 great, shit, shit, great, and put it through the system, you know? Yeah, right. Maybe. So do you think the reason Roadrunner got sw- swallowed up or the person running Roadrunner would allow it to get swallowed up is because that person in charge of Roadrunner had the vision that if he didn't do that, then exactly what we're experiencing now can, would happen. I can tell you exactly. And this is the, in fact, I've changed my answer to the previous one. This is the worst thing. This is the worst thing. And I'll, I, can, I can say this because no one comes out badly on this. So it's 2001, right? 2001, Roadrunner has gone through a phase where it's trying to expand beyond metal. This is like the mid 90s. Um, right. There's been some successes with bands like Blue Mountain and Kevin Salem and, and things like that. But, you know, the core roster is still Fear Factory, still Machine Head, uh, DSI still on the label and things like that. But 2001 comes about and uh, the label's hitting some financial trouble, right? So he goes out to the market and says, I wonder if anyone would like to buy a stake in Roadrunner. In comes IDJ, uh, Island Def Jam. And in July of 2001, the deal's finalized. They purchase 50%, I believe it's 50%, don't quote me. I think it's 50%. Um, and then all the financial troubles are resolved. What happens four weeks later? Slipknot's Iowa. What happens six weeks later? Nickelback's Silver Side Up. So the worst thing I've found in this documentary is had Case held on for a few months more, it could still have been an independent label today. That is so ind- indicative of any business. You it's know, crazy, like right? as a businessman... I was hearing you say that, and that's, you have to, as I put it, stick around till the finish line. Yeah. Oh, it's something Brian actually told me, Brian Slagle from Metal Blade. He's never met one person who sold their label and was happy with it. There you go. Yeah. And I, I could believe that. Yeah. Because almost every time you set, see the people buying, they see it. Yeah. And they take advantage. Yeah. Yeah. And so they know. What's going to happen next? It's, it's kind of cool. I mean, this is, why I, this is why I'm fascinated. And again, I could bore you to tears. But at the same time, right, Nickelback is, Monty Connor will say this as well, the A&R guy for Roadrunner, like A&R Spengali of all things metal. Nickelback was also the best thing to happen to, um, to Roadrunner and to metal in general because the money Nickelback brought in allowed the likes of Monty, Ron Berman, and another, another A&R guy, Mike Gitter, the guy that signed Kill Switch, the money that, that Nickelback brought in allowed them to experiment. So that's why we had this glorious era so in the 2000s with metalcore, bits of deathcore, lots of experimentation. So at the same time, yeah, IDJ saw the potential. They were buying Slipknot, were IDJ. They didn't know they were going to get Nickelback. Nice. So it kind of all worked out. And not nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that goes to my point. They, you got to see the vision. Yeah. And when you're in financial stress, you don't. My experience my whole life is mm. like exactly that. People stop short of the finish line because they get stressed out by the financial and they want to jump ship mm. and they're always jumping ship as yeah. the ship's about to take off. Mm. It just happens all the time, and which that- is allows the monsters to take over. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> they, they can lose the money. They don't care. But if you think about it, though, man, like once Roadrunner had its, its, its day and a lot of people were let go, 
the cross pollination into the rest of the industry. Like Monty Connors at Nuclear Blast now, Mike Gitters at Century Media, Michelle and Kirsten at Cosa Nostra PR over here, Mark Palmer's now at Nuclear Blast. So well, that talent is still out there, and the 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 know-how is still out there and is still active in the industry. It's just not not in that crazy little house that Case built in the 1980s, you know. And there's a lot of people I know in the U.S. Yeah, like Amy from Adam Splitter. Yep. You know, perfect example. Jamie Roberts from uh, for for the Win Media. Yep. Everybody yeah. I deal with over there. It's see, like I said in the beginning. It seems like everybody came from there. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's a shame they didn't all band together and keep it there. Hey man, that's an idea. We should fucking put that around today. Why right. Just all, why don't you just do like just a vertically integrated label? All of you. All of exactly. you quit your jobs. Start this new thing. Yeah, easy. See? Because <laughs> maybe is, with much? all those combined forces, yeah. they could compete. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, I wonder if they'd want to. I think, like, a lot of these guys, they've realized that the glory is are now there. That's something you always got to realize. Yeah. Sometimes we hold on to something. In my industry, it's very big. Like, yeah. I call it WKRP and Cincinnati Syndrome. It, what that means is there's a 70s radio, uh, the 70s TV show called WKRP in Cincinnati. And I say it all the time. That shit don't exist anymore. I have people that host shows with me and they're like, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, that doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. Would you, would you like a road on a fact about this? Yes. So, let's see. Um, what is it called? W. KRP in Cincinnati. So, this was. Um, there was a DJ on that. This there's a connection with the big disco, the disco the, that, that, Johnny this, Fever. Johnny Fever, disco sucks. And this all leads to the disco boom of the seventies. So happened in the disco boom of the seventies was Polygram, which was like the big major yeah. label. Casablanca. Kept, yeah, and Casablanca. Casablanca's hemorrhaging money. Everyone's riding around in limos. Polygram is uh, building more vinyl pressing plants, but no one's fucking buying it. You know, it, it was absolute inflation. The disco bubble burst. This is what happened. In the aftermath of the, the disco bubble bursting, Case Vessels, the guy that founded Roadrunner, this is in 77 and 78, he was fired from RCA, which is where he's working, and then he went on to form Roadrunner. And because of the lessons he's learned in the disco uh, boom, he realized the way to sort of retain the money in the record business is in the performing rights, right? So this is where the, you, sign, you sign on the dotted line. If the band signs with a label, the label owns all the recordings. That's where right. that comes from. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then, you know, how about you take stuff like back then and basically, like, as an example, do you think that there's, the destruction of metal for a while by grunge mm. also helped Roadrunner have its demise? Ooh, that's a good one. I don't think so. I think... I think what happened, what grunge did was it was basically a dog whistle for all the majors to go, oh, we should throw money at this alternative stuff, right? And when that sort of died a death in the sort of later 90s, they went, all right, there needs to be another alternative thing, and that was new metal. So threw all the money at that. I mean, if you look at like the new metal roster, there's a lot of bad bands in there, but they all had great videos. They had great marketing. There was like this, they all had great media and things like that. And then when it, that went and died down, it was into emo and things like that. But Roadrunner kind of sidestepped all those things. They didn't have a lot of great new metal artists. They didn't have a lot of great emo artists. They were trying to specialize in metal and hard rock. Yeah. That was their market thing. I think the thing that, I didn't, Roadrunner's not really dead. It's just changed. It's, it's just, you know, it's more, way more corporate. And what that was was simply 50% was owned by IDJ. They sold it onto Warner. Warner saw more money coming in. They went, okay, they saw like, they saw like Nickelback and Slipknot were still churning out albums, getting platinum records and fucking diamond records. They just bought more of it and they just went into ultimate ownership. And then the normal corporate thing happens, which is we can be more efficient here, guys. Let's just cut yeah. the head off the snake and let's just operate on a smaller, on a smaller footfall. It's no different than radio. Corporate took over radio. It, anybody you talk to before corporate took off over mm. radio is all they ever say is how they, they killed the fun of being in radio. Yeah. Turned it into a business. Yeah. And it basically destroyed the independent radio station. Yeah. And that's the same with any company, same with retail. 
Yeah. Same with automotive. Same with anything. Then once you get, once you get, once competition law doesn't kick in, and you have these giant monopolies, then it all becomes a race to the bottom. Yeah. And that's just what happened. So, what's your biggest hope from this documentary? I hope it gets fucking finished, mate. Well, that's a good one. <laughs> now, <laughs> if it, 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 now, if it's finished, what's your biggest hope? Oh well, you know what? I, I hope it's. Um, I hope people like it. I hope people learn something because it's it's a very academic story about like the music business and how it evolved and how metal had its role in the music business. Um, it's just really convenient that the story also takes place with all these characters, all these people, fucking merciful fate, sepulchre, typo, negative, she, all these people are all involved. Um, so I hope people like it at the end of the day. Um, and I hope it does help people, inform people that, you know, signing on the dotted line with a label isn't always the right thing. Uh, the game has totally changed since the 80s. And there's a lot of good shit out there that we can't let slip through the cracks. And we need to provide an infrastructure for it. That's what I hope for the documentary. Do you think it enabled companies like Spotify and that, to, uh, where it kind of changed the whole way people listen to music, mm. that maybe on purpose eliminated that middle area? Yeah. It took the it took the specialization out. It took the yeah. specialization out because everyone has a platform. All the shit stuff is also allowed to allowed to rise to the same level as all the good stuff. Right. I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing because I mean, um, who was I speaking to? Yes, I can't remember, but someone was telling me about Hellhammer. Hellhammer recorded when they couldn't play their instruments properly, so there was an arc there, and maybe there's a lot of opportunities in sort of the oversaturation that Spotify has provided, but it does make the job. A lot tougher. I mean, like the analogy I use is like, who's your favorite band? Is it Metallica? Who's your favorite artist? For me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slayer. Right. So there are ten. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shock you with this. There are ten bands in the world that are better than Slayer for you. Even the, the better than Slayer, but we'll never hear about them because they weren't allowed to rise to the top. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's the middle ground. Spotify allows everything to go at the same level, but without that expertise to take those bands that are ten, you know, those ten bands that are better than Slayer, curate them and deliver them to the market. We're just gonna be stuck sludging through the ship. Yeah, you know we Makes need the sense. expertise in there. So, what haven't we covered in this interview that people need to know about the industry, about the documentary, and where we're going from here? So, Roadrunner gets a bad. I'll, I'll start on like what people should learn about Roadrunner. Roadrunner was it was an absolute powerhouse. But everyone acknowledges it as an absolute powerhouse. What people need to learn is it was an emerging business model, right? I mean, at this time, you had like your Sabbaths and Maidens and Metallicas and, and, and well, maybe not Metallica at this stage, but they were aligned to the majors. There wasn't really a lot of independent metal things going on, especially from an infrastructure perspective. So the story of Roadrunner is really the story of an emerging business model. And it really has like, it's a three-part structure. It's like Star Wars and New Hope, all the action happening in the 80s. Empire Strikes Back. All these things still happen. A bit of a bum out ending in 2001 when they have to be bought out by IDJ. And then Return of the Jedi. Maybe not Return of the Jedi, but then still Return of the Jedi. Yeah. Good, bouncy fun for another 10 years until it all goes to shit, I guess, right? That's the story of Roadrunner. Very interesting, very sort of like analytical look at how the industry has evolved, definitely. In terms of the documentary, just keep your eye out for it. Get on Instagram to History of Roadrunner Records. Um, I'm looking for camera people. <laughs> if, any, if anyone uh, wants to jump behind the camera while I conduct interviews in the UK, by all means, shout out. But yeah, it's an ongoing project, and I used to, I used to be quite protective of the information that, like around how I'm doing it. But now I'm like, ah, oh, fuck it. It's, it's, go. it's a good, you know. If you want to know some behind the scenes stuff, I'll see some footage. Just let me know. I'll show you. As anybody you've interviewed through all this time think it was a bad idea for you to do this documentary or didn't like the idea that you were doing yes. this documentary? Yes. Do you I want, can't name them. I don't want you to name them. Yes. Can you tell me why? No. Okay. I mean, it's all Grapevine stuff. There's some people who are like absolutely not happy that it's happening and want it to not happen. And, but As I, everything. Because it's, because it's like through the Grapevine, I don't know what it is. It's probably, it's probably a miscommunication. It's probably a misunderstanding. People might think that I'm from Roadrunner. I'm not from Roadrunner. I'm completely independent. Uh, people think it might have an agenda. It doesn't have an agenda. It's a rather, it's a rather agnostic look at what Roadrunner, Roadrunner was as a function. Um, but yeah, there are some people out there. 
They do, they do come around, though. They always come around. It's like anything, right? Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. It's cool you're doing it. I've had a lot of experience with Roadrunner, so I think it's a great thing. And uh, thanks for being here at Bloodstock to add more to it. Can't wait till it comes out. And thanks for being on the Adventures of Pipe Man. Thanks, buddy. Thank you for listening to the Adventures of Pipe Man on W4CY Radio.